question is, and it can apply not only to the debate on global warming, but to many scientific scenarios we're now facing as we advance our technologies and industries, how do you get science and scientists to ignore the agendas, the political and public sentiments of those who are funding the research, and tell us the truth as they believe it, not garnished by the popular or the preferred opinions of the moment? The two parts of this. One of this, I'll give you the, my easy comment first. Okay. And part of what's going on here is traceable to scientifically illiterate journalists. What happens is you have a journalist who has a certain ethos of reporting on a story. And that ethos will be you get somebody who has a point of view, and then you look for somebody who has the opposite point of view, and you present that, even Stephen, in the article. And then you pat yourself on the back as a journalist who is even-handed, who does not take sides on one side, one story or another. And this works in politics and religion and a lot of other walks of life where data are kind of not relevant and people's opinions of the world are. And so you want to make sure you have both sides of an opinion. In science, however, it works differently from that. What you get is an emergent consensus. And a scientific consensus is not the kind of a consensus that would happen in a business meeting. A business meeting, people sit around a table, and one person has an idea, and they, someone might dissent, but they'll try to they'll convince you, and say, oh, okay, now I believe you, I understand. And you come out with a consensus. A scientific consensus is different. It's everybody's doing experiments in the lab, in the field, and they get a result or another. New subjects that are on the frontier, no scientist will agree. That's what the frontier of research is, is about. You'll have disputes over interpretations of data, and that's in almost every case because the data are poor or insufficient to distinguish one idea cleanly from another. So people basically choose up sides, and they duke it out in the coffee lounges and in the journals and in the conferences. That's the frontier of science. As the data become better and better, fewer and fewer people on that frontier dissent because the experiments begin to agree with each other. They start saying the same thing. They start recognizing that there's an emergent scientific truth that's underfoot. And when a scientific consensus emerges, you're done with that and then you move on to the next subject. And so what has happened is a scientific consensus has emerged on the global warming problem. And you measure that by published papers and what they say. And you look at published papers, 99% of them talk about the human influence global warming of the world mm -hmm. in the era of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. It wasn't 99% 20 years ago. Not enough people were working on it, and we didn't know. Do the experiments, you have the computer models. This is an emergent consensus. Okay. The press thinks it's still controversial. So they find the 1% of the scientists and put them up as though they're 50% of the research results. Got it. You in the public would have no idea that this is basically a done deal and we're on to other problems because the journalists are trying to give it a 50-50 story. It's not a 50-50 story. It's not. Period. Well, and that's one answer. And I think what this young gentleman is trying to say is, so then if we... Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Go ahead. I'm getting back to the gentleman's okay. point. A very yeah. point I left out. Sorry. Okay. No, that's all right. So... <laughs> So what you need are journalists to look at the published data and recognize that there's an emergent consensus going on here and they are no longer being responsible journalists to give half of their journalistic time to, to the diminishing 1% of who's left over after this emergent consensus has taken foot. Now, just are human just like everybody else. Scientists are susceptible to cultural, political, uh, economic forces just like everybody else. No doubt about it. And so the difference is the enterprise of science is resistant to those forces. That's why we have peer review. That's why we require repeatability of experiments. Because if you do have a bias that influences your results, that's going to show up when somebody else does your experiment who's disinterested in, or who's paid by different sources, who's not paid by any sources at all. And so that's why you have the enterprise of science to keep 
the individuals who practice the science honest. Okay. So or to catch them when they're not being honest. And that's been in place. That's in place. And given that fact, you have this emergent consensus. So to summarize, you're basically saying that journalists should not get their information from Wikipedia. <laughs> and you're also <laughs> saying that the conspiracy theories of skewed scientific facts, that it's mostly just in movies. Oh, by all means. And okay. one way to look at an emergent scientific truth is look, look to see if a scientific result is the same even from different labs as well as from different approaches to the question. So you look at people who study ice cores in Greenland or in Antarctica, and they get a certain result regarding the warming trends. Then you look at oceanographic people who look at sort of uh, effects of temperature on, on marine animals. Then you look at tree rings, and then you look at you know, you pick different branches of science, and if they all start saying the same thing, you've got, you've got a problem on your hands. Mm -hmm. You've got a real emergent cultural social problem on your hands that you're going to now have to address, and it might, re might require a political solution, but it gives you a level of confidence. Had it been one person's results, and you want to build a whole science policy on it, and if for a nation, I'd say, hold off for a bit. Mm -hmm. Wait to see if this result repeats in other branches of science, in other walks of life, in other scientific labs. And that's what you have today in the global warming problem. That's very thorough, thank you. And speaking of space exploration and examination, this is question number four, and it is probably the most crucial question that I'm going to ask you for this whole interview. Are you ready? <laughs> sure. Believe it or not, it's from a top American executive, and you probably might know him, but I've promised to keep his name anonymous. So he paused in his very busy, important work day to ask you this burning question. Since you are the person responsible for the change in status, do you plan to write to the Trivial Pursuit people because they haven't yet changed the answer on the back of the question card that asks, what is the farthest planet from the sun? <laughs> He's upset, Dr. Tyson, because he doesn't like giving up that green pie piece when his opponents answer Pluto. So it's now the wrong answer, and the game people haven't changed it, and they haven't recalled the cards. So can we let him know that you'll have a word with them? <laughs> uh, sort of like that James Cameron thing that you wrote about in your book, isn't it? Yeah. It's possible to know more than the people who write the questions in a, in a quiz show. Okay. That's possible. And, in fact, uh, it reminds me of the rules for Scrabble. In the rules for Scrabble, everyone agrees on which dictionary is being used, and then you stick with it, even if other dictionaries give you a different answer, because the definiteness of a source matters as much to the running of the game as whether or not the answer is correct. So I think the thing to do with Trivial Pursuit is recognize that some institutions in our culture are behind. <laughs> And you have to give the answer that they're looking for, whether or not it's the right answer. Okay. And I'll give other examples of this, such as you can ask the question, how many stars are there in the Big Dipper? Well, there's seven bright ones, but one of them, the middle star of the handle, is, has two stars in it. Miser and Alcor, it's a double star system. Are you going to add that one? Then it's eight. Actually, the Big Dipper is like part of a, a, a star cluster in the sky that has dozens of other stars in it. And so do you include those?